Welcome everybody to lecture 12, Databases and Information Systems, the course that can also be taken as information retrieval. This year our topic today is language models. It's the last uh, lecture in this course with uh, real content. First I will say something about the last sheet, which was about logistic regression, one slide about the exam registration, and then uh, language models. So uh, let me briefly say it was a very ambitious plan <laughs> which we had for the last uh, three lectures, which culminates today because, I mean, we all know language models, chat GPT and so on, and we wanted to at least explain to you <laughs> how it works in principle. But it's not so easy and uh, doing this in three lectures, well, we tried. Completely, uh, today is a completely new lecture, so it was a lot of work for Sebastian and also uh, for me. So there will be some errors, I'm sure, but we tried our best, so it's the last sheet and it's kind of a high point, maybe. Let's see how it goes. So, uh, first about the experiences with, okay, here's already the first error, maybe you can count how many we have. Uh, with the last sheet, so here are some uh, excerpts from what you wrote. One more exercise sheet to go along with a set of absolutely great and well thought out sheets from this course. Thank you. So much of that is uh, due to Sebastian's fant fantastic work. It's really a lot of work. And as I always say, the exercise sheets are the most important part. If you don't do it, uh, you learn by doing. That's just how it is. The lecture was fun. It's the one about logistic regression. My first contact with anything learning. So I think, yeah, we have like two kinds of people in this course. Those uh, who already heard learning courses, they also found it interesting and some for which it was the first time. Fun and interesting to play around with the hyperparameters. Quite a few of you wrote something about that. It's sometimes not as you expect it to be, nice sheet to learn. So, yeah, you, you made very different experiences as to if I learned for longer, more epochs, for some people it became better, for some worse, for some it first became better, then worse, so that's the thing with hyperparameters, completely topic on its own. Yeah, you can tune the batch size, you can uh, learn for longer, you can change the learning rate, you can even change it dynamically and that makes a big difference. And the interplay, maybe you have a bug in your code. Let me say this one thing with, maybe you, something is not quite right in your code, then it still works, but just not as good as it can. That's uh, not easy with this kind of work. Small alpha and batch size, but use enough epochs, was the conclusion by somebody else. A bit more implementation advice could have saved trouble. And one comment was, I think it was the only strongly negative comment, I dislike that the last sheets rely so much on PyTorch. I, I, we discussed this in our weekly tutor meeting. I don't think I agree because, I mean, when you use linear algebra, you don't want to do the matrix multiplication by yourself. You have to use a library for this and, and not only because it's more convenient, because it's super inefficient if you do matrix multiplication with loops by yourself in Python. It was never finished. So you have to use some library, and we really only used PyTorch for the very simple stuff. As with every library, there's so much else, but I think we separate it quite nicely. That's what you need, and then all the other rest you don't need it. We will use a bit more today so yeah, they relied on PyTorch, but really only for multiply this matrix with this vector, give me these uh, columns from the matrix, uh, normalize the vector and so on. So pretty basic stuff. I think that that was doable and we gave you a cheat sheet. And we will show the master solution from this exercise sheet because it will be our starting point for today. So. These are two lectures in one, the same lecture. So 119 of you, uh, uh, speaking of yesterday, registered for databases and information systems. And that is this exam number in the HISIN one. And 90 of you registered for information retrieval. So you had a choice. And we looked at the list and we saw a just quick check whether they are disjoint. And they are not disjoint at all. 
So it, it was not possible in the Hisin one to say either or because that's a very unusual situation. So some of you, I don't know what exactly your motivation was, you maybe thought better register for both, better safe than sorry. Yeah, sorry, you, you can't register for both. I mean, it's just you, you can only register for one. So if you register for both, Actually, I don't have the, Sebastian, do we have the count? How many registered? We, we don't have it yet, but it's also not important. Now, in case you registered for both, you have to make up your mind, obviously. Yeah? You have to say, I want the ECTS points for this one or for this one. And just to make that one clear again, it was allowed, for a one-time thing, that if you heard information retrieval in the past, then you can also take now database and information systems, although there is some overlap with the previous course. That's also okay. Of course, you also can't get the same points again for this course. So make up your mind. It has to be one of them. I think you will manage. <coughs> so on with the contents. Let's see how we do with the time. But I think, uh, yeah, so models. What, what is a model? First, uh, w what's the goal for today? So in lecture 11, let's look back very briefly how we started. Lecture 10, we just started with all things linear algebra, right? Before that, it was more classical approaches, which are also important. Standard databases will be important for, they will not die out because of learning stuff. Both stuff is important, both things. Lecture 10, we started very lightly with look at things as vectors in linear algebra. Lecture 11, logistic regression, was our first um, like a learning method. And we looked at like the simplest problem. Let me maybe uh, show that problem again. It was uh, these movies. And we just had movie text. It was movie plots, so that it was a little bit harder. What happens in the movie, not the... Wikipedia description of the movie and then say just from what's happening in the movie from the words say is it funny is it a comedy or not it's kind of the simplest kind of learning problem just learn yes or no binary classification two class and we used kind of the simplest method to do this called logistic regression and we will look at it again it's very simple very basic but very important it's not uh, yeah, just because it's simple, it's important. And today, starting from this, and there's some logic to it, you will see it, we want to generalize this to learning almost anything. And uh, we will do something very nice, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, namely now. What we will do now, so what we kind of did in the last lecture, you implemented, and in the exercise sheet, logistic regression from scratch just using linear algebra. And uh, I will have some recap here. And now we will just implement it again, but in a more general framework. And the goal is, <laughs> it's a typical refactoring thing, we just do it again, and the result is exactly the same as before. So we have achieved nothing, except now we are on a different level. It's now in a, and now in this new framework, we can do much more powerful thing easily. Yeah, so that's the goal for the first half, to do exactly the same <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but still achieve something. And then we solve this more complex task, which is something like uh, GPT-like. Very simple, of course, but uh, it works. And uh, so this is what we will do together, re-implement logistic regression, so that you learn how, how to do learning in uh, PyTorch, and then you will apply this to this more complex task and please do the exercise sheet. And it will be very hands-on, but also not naturally some background. So pay attention and do ask questions. Use the fact that you are here. So let's lift what we did in the last lecture to the next level and try to understand this and please ask questions. It's uh, it's a bit abstract, but I think understandable. So we have a function, and look how general it is. Any input, any output. But the thing is, we don't know that function. And it's, uh, for this example, the function is, given a movie plot, 
say whether it's funny or not. That's, that's our function which we want to compute. And we know it for some movies, we don't know it for every movie. And the point of this first line is, as often is the case in mathematics, that function exists, but we don't know how to do it, right? This is what we want to learn. Okay, given the movie plot, yes, it's funny or not, but how do we find it out? And that's what a model does. A model is another function, and we call it M for model, which also takes the movie plot, in this case, as input, and something else, namely uh, uh, parameters, N of them. They don't have to be real parameters, but for the lecture today, let's let them just be real numbers. So, we have the input, the movie plot, N parameters, N real values, and then we say funny or not. And depending on which of these n values we put here, the function does this or that. And the goal is to find the w, to find the setting of the parameters, such that the model does something good. So if I set the parameters in any way, I will get a function of the same kind. Yeah? Given a movie plot, say funny or not. And now I can compare it to the original uh, function. And I want to compare it, and of course what I want, I want it to be as similar to the function which I'm trying to, which I don't know, as possible. And for that I need a loss function, which is kind of a similarity measure, or a difference measure. It's called a loss function in this context, and uh, yeah, it's called loss. I mean, you always have to decide, do you want to maximize or minimize? You could also say a gain function, you want to maximize it. One speaks of loss function, you want to minimize it. That is, here's the real thing, this movie is funny, my method said it's not funny. So now I have to say, okay, that this costs you 20 euro something. So I somehow I have to measure the difference. For this problem it's easy. And now what we want to find is, we want to find the setting of the parameters so that this model with this parameter setting is as close to my function as possible. And by close, that's another thing we already saw it in the last lecture, we evaluate it on some functions because we don't know all the values, right? We have our test set, some movies for which we know the labels and we evaluate it on that or some training set. And we just took the sum. This could be made even more general, but that's kind of the level of generality we will work with today. So a little bit of notation here, but I think in the context of the concrete problem we already saw, it's understandable, but please do ask questions because that's the basis for everything else. Now, is that clear enough? Any question? Yes, please. Yes, exactly. And not only is it a black box function, but we also don't know it. We don't have a formula for it. That's the point. And we are looking for a function for which we have a formula. Yes, that's exactly the point. And I think it will become clear by more examples. Danke, Frank. And we will start with logistic regression again. So now let's just put logistic regression, that's what we will do for the first half, in this framework again. It's just a recap from the last lecture. So, and, and what kind of functions? Now, for every model you have, you have to say, okay, this is a model for which kinds of functions? And logistic regression is a model when you have functions that take as input something in n-dimensional, so let me always go back to this example. What we did here, we took a movie plot and turned it into an n-dimensional vector by just summing up the word embeddings, right? That's what we did. 300-dimensional it was. And the output is something in 0, 1, where actually what we are given, there's little detail here, maybe I come back to it. The function is actually just 0 or 1, but that's also not wrong. We could also imagine that it says uh, 0 0.5, it would also work. And the model looks like this, that's what we did. So now we have, we get a movie as n-dimensional vector and we get some parameters. Actually, okay, here I've already 
it's debatable whether I should write plus one here because of this additional dimension. Let's forget this for now. And, and that's what we did. So we had these parameters here and the input vector, and we just took the dot product and the sigmoid function, and this then gives us something between zero and one, yes or no, or something in between. Right? That's what logistic regression did in this uh, framework. We didn't have a loss function last lecture, but we had likelihood, if you remember. We maximized likelihood. But maximizing something, this is what we maximized, and I will uh, have it again on a separate slide. Maybe you remember this. If, uh, if here for the, so the Y is the real thing, the actual label, and uh, the prediction is the sigma uh, and then the scale, uh, yeah, the dot product of uh, W and X, that's what we had. If you plug this here for Y prime, you get exactly the formula from the last lecture, and we wanted to maximize this. We call this likelihood. Let's just put minus here and call it the loss, and then we want to minimize it, right? So it was not the likelihood, it was the log likelihood. And we will see it again on another slide. So that's just what we did in the last lecture, right? We had this kind of model, these kinds of functions. This was our loss. We said without the minus, this is what we want to maximize. So with the minus, that's what we want to minimize. And that's what we did. Very briefly, this is a multi uh, two-class classification. You get yes or no. You can also do multinomial logistic regression. We will not do it today. And then the function is, and let me introduce this funny symbol here. I didn't know it myself yesterday. Now, if you have uh, M classes, M things to decide between, uh, then the output is a probability distribution, right? Now you have to say, yeah, you could either say it's one of the M classes, but you could also say, okay, it's 20% of this one, 40% of this one, 60% of this one. So what this really is, it's the set of all probability distributions over M things. Let me briefly rest on this. Why then is it called M minus one? Well, it's called M minus one because probabilities have to sum to one, right? So you really just have only uh, M minus one degrees of freedom. You can understand this when you go back. This is also, you have two outcomes here. It's binary, right? Yes and no. And if you want a probability distribution there, 20% yes, 80% uh, no. It's two numbers, but just one degree of freedom, right? If you say the probability for yes is 20%, probability for no is just one minus. So that's why if you want a probability distribution, you have m minus one things which you want to compute, and the mth one is just one minus the sum of the rest. And this is called the uh, standard simplex, by the way. I was looking for notation, and this is the best I could. Uh, so that's called, uh, I think, the standard simplex. Because if you simplex, if you imagine it in, as a geometry, Thing. And it's like a pyramid, a triangle, a pyramid, or something like this. Standard logistic regression is a special case of this, and this is just for, for information. So for what is this for m equals 2? If you have two classes, then this is a probability distribution over two things. And then uh, yeah, this is essentially just uh, yeah, one probability is enough. I don't think it's correct to say equal here, but it is more or less that. Yeah, it's the, yeah, you have two numbers between zero and one, which sum to one. Mm -hmm. We don't have time for MLR. I would love to do it. It's a, we could do it in 15 minutes given what I will show you next, but uh, it's actually not hard. You might want to do it yourself if you, if you like with the techniques I will now show you. Okay, and now we don't do this yet. It's for the second half. What's the language model? A language model is, now the input is 
Now look, we, in, in this general thing we just have to say what's our input, what's our output. Now the input is n things from our vocabulary. Let's just call them words for now. Later we will also see it doesn't have to be words, but for the first part I want to call it words. I have n things and now I want to pre uh, predict the next thing, which is, and this is a probability distribution again over the things I have, for example, the words. So this is just given n words, compute the probability distribution over the next word. And understand, just like in logistic regression, why it's not, why is it not the set V here? Just predict the next word. Well, there could be several words, right, that are possible. Given this sequence of five words, you might want to say, okay, the truth might be 20% of the times this word, 30% of the times this word, 50% of the times this word. So it's really a probability distribution over. Let me just look around. 20% of the people are busy with their smartphones or other devices. I would pay attention if I were here, if I, if I were you. So that's what we will see in the last part. And, and uh, I, w I will show you how to, how to do this. And, and ChatGPT et al., which you all know, is based on exactly something like this, right? If you use ChatGPT, you know that things come word by word. It's exactly for that reason. It will always pre just predict the next word. Uh, and it's quite amazing that uh, something intelligent comes out of this. Whether it's intelligent or not is a matter of debate. So. Let's briefly go back to our uh, definition here. So we have this model, we have these parameters, and the goal is to find the best parameter setting so that we approximate, we have something which we can evaluate, which approximates what we are interesting in, interested in. How do we find that? Let's also generalize what we did for logistic regression last time. Uh, that's now the more general routine, which in principle works for any model. So you start with some setting. I'm looking for the best setting so that my model function does what it should. Let's start with a random, t I think for the exercise sheet we will do something random, but sometimes it also just works to start with all zero weights. It's not meaningful yet. Now you take, you have some examples like here, right? I have all kinds of uh, movie plots and I have the right answer. Divide it into batches and process the batches in random order. You always do that for, for reasons. We briefly talked about it in the last lecture. And now for each batch you compute this gradient. That's also what we did in the last lecture. In the last lecture, we will see it again on one of the next slides, we actually computed the gradient of the likelihood. Now we will compute the gradient of the loss. And, and one thing here, I, I made a slight notation mistake here. I, I wrote the, in uh, lecture 11, I wrote the gradient as I wrote it like this, I think, using this partial uh, this is a bit, I have to write this nicer. It's just a notation thing, but just so that you aren't uh, confused. I wrote it like, did I use a different color now? So let me try again, like this. And this is what you use for partial derivatives, right? Let me just briefly explain this. I mean, it was of course, where is it now? It was of course correct to use this. So I have now uh, different directions because I'm uh, in, a, in a higher dimensional space. So when I, in the direction of this weight, so if I change this weight a little bit, what will happen to my likelihood? If I change this weight a little bit, what will happen to my likelihood? Will it become uh, more or less and by how much? This is what the partial derivatives give me. And if I put all the partial derivatives together, in one vector, this gives me the gradient. So if I go in this direction with all my weights, then my likelihood will increase the most. And this thing is called, yeah, I just wrote it like this, so nabla 
is just a, this is just if you put all of them in a vector. So I take the, I, I mean, it might look frightening to some of you, but it's just notation. So if I, yeah, and we have n here. Yeah, you just put all the uh, partial derivatives in one vector, and that's called a uh, nabla. <coughs> it's the nabla operator. Let me also nabla. Okay, so we, and it's, it's the gradient. We call it the gradient. Okay. We will see on the next slide, one of the next slides. Actually, we didn't compute the gradient of the loss, but of the likelihood, of the log likelihood, but it's the same. One is just minus the other. So, yeah. And, and then we went in the direction of the gradient, which means we did plus gradient, but actually, uh, if, you, if you take the loss, which is the minus, you take minus gradient. So that's what you do, and we will do this again, recap this again a little bit. You compute, okay. And let's try to understand in loss terms again what we do. What we do here is say, okay, I want to minimize my loss. I'm at a certain parameter setting. And now what this gradient tells me, okay, if you go in that direction, <laughs> you are getting a little bit lower in your loss. So just go in that direction. You're in some landscape. I drew a picture. So walk a little bit in that direction, and there it will go downhill with the loss. It's not clear that you will reach the absolute uh, minimum there, but at least it goes downhill, right? In this landscape, you want to find the lowest loss, so go in the direction where it goes downhill the steepest. And then you have to say, how much do I go in that direction before I evaluate again? And that's the learning rate, right? I mean, the gradient gives you a direction. Now the question is, how much do I walk in that direction? So that's the general procedure. And we already also introduced some uh, not notation terminology here. You divide into batches for efficiency reasons, but also for, for several reasons. One reason is efficiency. You could just evaluate it one at a time. Just look at the next example, change a little bit. That's not efficient. Or look at all the training samples together and make a change that's also not efficient because the matrices are huge. That's what, why you do it in batches. There are also other reasons. I won't talk about them today, stochastic reasons. And then once you do this for all your training data, please also understand this again. I go through this data and let's just look at how many there are. It's also important to understand. So here there are 50,000 of them. Now you could say, okay, I've seen them once, now I'm done. But now you can just do it again, because now you are at a different parameter setting, right? You can do it again and again and again, and that's what you also do. And doing it once is called an epoch, and you can repeat that for any number of times. And that's what we did. And when does this approach work, this generic approach? It works as long as we know how to compute this loss, this gradient, which we did for logistic regression. And now let's, uh, let's do that again, recap, and let's also implement this, but now a little bit uh, differently. So exercise sheet 11, for those who did it, this is what you did. You turned the document into uh, vectors, and maybe I should uh, write documents here. Yeah, and let me let me say it again because it's so important. So what you did is you each document here we gave you word vectors, 300-dimensional vectors for each word. You just summed them up, and now you have a 300-dimensional vector for this movie plot, which is exactly the kind of input we want, right? So now for each <laughs> movie plot, we have a 300 dimensional vector, and we wrote that code for you, by the way, so you didn't have to do it. Now we split it into batches, that's what we did, and for each batch we computed this a gradient of the log likelihood according to a formula which we derived, it was the last part of the lecture, and then we updated the parameters using the gradient. And what PyTorch lets you do, and what we will use today, 
And I think now is a good time maybe to go to the code. Let's just look at the code. And it's the code from the master solution. And let me, OK. Dark mode, not bad, but I don't know why. How do I get the color scheme now to? Cannot find. Why, why is it not showing me the? My, now I have to choose the color scheme online. So which one do you want? I don't know. That's uh, hard now. I, I don't know why it's I already desert. OK, it's just 500 or so. Let's see whether we, which one is the one which we? Where? Okay, but shouldn't I just choose a color scheme? Um. Ah, maybe default, maybe default. Because I just want to use the one from the, uh, that's, yeah. Oh. Okay, so we have something to do for the next uh, col colder, okay. <coughs> I think we have to, <coughs> what was our color scheme? This is stupid. Elf Lord. No, we don't want Elf Lord. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we have to do this. I think a dark screen does not work well with the dark blue Delic. What do you think? No? no let's, uh, it's fun. Industry. Morning. We already had morning. Peach Puff. This sounds bad. But it's not. How is it? No, it's not, it's not good. Peach Puff. Oh my. Pablo Murphy. <coughs> Soppy. <laughs> Todd. Oh my. I'm so sorry, but uh, it, it will only, it's only two minutes. Do you have any idea? I really don't know what we... We tried desert, right? That was... Elf Lord evening. No, not evening. I'm so sorry. You can uh, try yourself in the, in your, uh, if you're sitting at, in front of a machine. But it's not so many, okay. I really don't know why it doesn't work. That's not nice, right? At, at least it's. Uh, Do you think so? Yeah, because background into? Uh, background equals the light. And then if you just do the thing to the ball, I think it works. Okay, you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was worth a try. Okay. I'm really sorry. But do you have other plans for today? No, right? Which one? Retrobox. Yeah, so sounds good, but I don't know why it's not doing the ah I have an I have some idea, but maybe it's uh, the wrong idea. But let me try it. If I just uh, if something changed, you always have to ask yourself what changed. And what changed is I think that I wrote something in my, where's my NeoVim con? Here, now here should have an init.vim. And I think I, da, 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 da. do I have, yeah, yeah, here I set the scholar scheme. And let me maybe not set the scholar scheme. Hmm. But that's, that looks like what we had, right? So I think I solved it. Sorry. So let's just continue. Short break. And uh, let's look at the master solution code. So I hope you're still with me for logistic regression. And uh, it is uh, 400 something lines, but it's a lot of boilerplate code. Let's briefly get an overview because we will work with this for the rest of the lecture. It's important. And we gave a lot to you. So this is uh, 
tokenization. You have to break, yeah, let me just show this on the, yeah. So you have to break this into words. We gave that code to you. Compute the vocabulary, so the distinct set of words in this. We also did that for you, I think. Then you have to read the data and some unit tests here. We did that for you. And here we have, uh, I think that was not supposed to be in there, doesn't matter. And now the logistic regression. So, uh, yeah, these were the weights. So if we have a n-dimensional vector, we take one more for this additional dimension, the one, uh, and then we just set it to zero. So we started with zero. This is for adding the one to the input vector. We did that. And uh, that's what we did here, just add a one. And then we have the training. And in the training, so we had several epochs. I just uh, explained that here. We had, uh, we divided it into batches. That's what we do here. Here, I just get the indices of the batch. So now I have my, uh, this here in a matrix, in a tensor, 2D tensor, so a matrix. So I just say, okay, give me these column indices. And this just says, okay, select these columns. So now I have a sub-matrix, I call this XB. That's now a batch of documents. B stands for batch, and these are the labels, so the things in column one here. And now that's just, uh, yeah. Let's maybe go back to this in a second. Let's go back to the slides first. Okay, one point I wanted to make here. So. What do I mean when I say from scratch in the lecture? We did everything ourselves, right? Epochs, we have a for loop here. Batches, divide into batches, go over the batches. Now we say, okay, add the ones. Now we say, uh, yeah, this is exactly what our model does, right? Compute the W, multiply it with uh, the documents. Here it's a batch of documents, so it's a matrix multiplication. It simultaneously multiplies the weights with each document. You don't need a, it's the point of linear algebra, right? Then you compute the gradient. This is just the likelihood thing here. And now you update uh, your weights plus learning rate times gradient, right? So we did everything ourselves, like we developed in the vector. It's not a lot of code, that's always nice, and it worked. Let me maybe show that before we continue, so that we see it once. Let me just run this for one epoch. So this is now running it for one epoch, and it takes some time, so it's going over the training data once. We have seen it, 50,000 movies. And okay, and now it computes. And let's look at these numbers because whatever we do now, we want the same numbers. So remember them. So this works. And let's also check whether the unit test works. Yes, they also work. And now we want to rewrite this. And we want to rewrite it. The thing, like the hard thing, and let me say that again, this is kind of. Yeah, it's, I'm just taking a batch of things. This will remain. But this is kind of where we put in the word work, right? We said, okay, evaluate this model function. And then we had to compute the gradient on paper. And now this decisive change, we will now let PyTorch figure out this gradient. We will not compute it ourselves. And let's see how we do that. So this was our model function. And now we will, PyTorch has the bias explicitly again. If, uh, and I have a slide where I explain that. So, uh, and in PyTorch, I will now do the following. And uh, so now I will just write, uh, let's see how, uh, yeah, let me just call it implement the uh, logistic the model function for a logistic regression in PyTorch. Okay, and uh, yeah, let's call it logistic regression model. And it's a subclass of, so I use Torch NN uh, 
module. That's just how it call how it's called. And now I need two steps. The first is what are my parameters? This I put in the constructor. So let's write the constructor. Def in it. And I have to say how many features I get. Yeah, num features, or let me just call it n here. So now I have first have to call the, yeah, that's correct. I have to call the constructor of the base function, whatever PyTorch does there, don't forget that. And now this is just uh, the w with, it's just a vector of uh, n dimensions. And it's just something, why is it called linear n1? It's something which you can multiply with an n-dimensional vector, that's what the n here says, and then you get a one, just a scalar, a one thing. If you would write two here, it's something you can multiply it with an n-dimensional vector, and then you get two values, then it would be a two by n matrix. And let's, so that's what we do here. So we have something from PyTorch, which is just a, an n-dimensional vector. And now we want to initialize it with zeros. So it's very similar, and we also want to uh, have the bias. <clears throat> so now, little difference to before, and I have a slide on why it's not a backstep. Why do we have, didn't I say it's nicer uh, if the bias is part of the weight vector? Well, in, in PyTorch it's not, because then we don't have to add ones or something like that to the input. So we just, yeah, we just have this additional line here. And I have more on the slide. And let, uh, <coughs> And now I need to say, okay, these are my parameters. And now I have to <coughs> specify my function, right? These are just the parameters or the components from which I build my function. Now I have to say, <coughs> and maybe write that here, uh, <coughs> parameters uh, of our model function and how we uh, initialize them. <coughs> okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. Our uh, the implementation of our model functions based on parameters. Let me just be verbose here in init let me bring this to the top. Okay, <clears throat> and now that's very easy. We, we basically do the same thing here. Now we just use torch functions and that's important. So as I said, we are doing something here and achieving nothing because the goal is to have the same functionality as before. But so let's just do this here. Let's uh, return torch yeah, and it's already Mm -hmm. Okay, and let me put, so I'm just saying linear x will just, it will just do this weights here, w dot product with x plus or minus the bias rather. That's what it will do. And I will say, and let me add this flat in here and I will explain, I have a slide explaining this. So modulo details, this is exactly this here is exactly, if I scroll down a bit, <laughs> this here, right? Just in a few more lines and using PyTorch. It's exactly for evaluating. And by the way, the initialization, we also had it somewhere up here. Yes, here we had our initialization. We had, yeah, we just put everything in the weights. That's plus one, it's like the bias term. And then we initialized it to zero. So basically we just rewrote that part using PyTorch. A few explanations on this one. Why the bias again? Didn't we say it's easier without the bias? Well, the point was, if you think about the last lecture, it's much easier to do the math which, uh, without the bias because without the bias, you don't have to write W and B everywhere. It's just W. If you do it in uh, code, Actually, yeah, you have to add the ones to the input vectors. Let me briefly go back to the code. We have a function for this, add bias, which now we don't need because PyTorch will just take uh, care of it. So PyTorch will actually compute W times X minus B here. So I don't need to add anything to my vectors, which is nice. Also, I don't have to change them. 
Why the flatten? We have already seen that too. Let's just go, uh, I hope you don't lose orientation. What is this doing? That's a PyTorch specific thing. This is now computing the dot product of W with X minus B. And what does this give me? You would expect that it gives me a scalar vector, but it actually gives you a or actually if you do it for B documents, that it gives you a vector of B values, but it actually gives you a, a matrix with one row vector with B values. And I think I have it here on the slide, or even the, uh, yeah, I think. So this component here, which does just a dot product, uh, gives you a, a matrix with just one column vector, right? We already had this in the last lecture. And what I just is, I would just want the column vector. So that's just a PyTorch thing. You get a good error message whenever you have that problem. I think several of you encountered this, that it tells you dimensions do not match. And that's when you use flatten. So you have a matrix with just one vector as a row or a column, and you just want the vector, because the next function wants a vector and not a matrix with one vector. And then just say flatten. Flatten has also more arguments. For example, if you have a whole matrix of vectors, you can also turn it into one, one vector by concatenating them and stuff like this. Flatten can also do that, but here it's like the simplest case of flatten. Just extract. Okay, so that's really the same thing as before. Just with a little more code, but not even more code. And the nice thing is we have it in one class. Is there any question about this? That's just the same thing written in, in PyTorch. And maybe one more aspect here. Here we get a tensor as input, not just, I mean, of course it's all tensors. That's not just an individual input. That's why it's capital X, it's a batch of inputs, right? So this framework is always for processing batches. So this will compute with one operation uh, the sigmoid of the uh, dot product with B things at the same time. So the output will be B probabilities. And now we want to do the uh, compute the gradient. And how do we do that in PyTorch? Well, if, let's now go to the code and let's maybe, let us be bold. I think I will Hmm. Yeah, I think here I can now just, let me do it like this. Let me just call. So now I'm just using, and I'm deleting this. And, and this I will upload, so you can use it. Don't worry. So now I say, okay, let's use my model and initialize the weights here. Here I call it num features, just the dimensionality of my input, 300 for the embeddings. Add bias, I don't need it. I can delete it, I hope. And now, let's go down here. Okay, now I have to say I want to uh, compute gradients. And here is, uh, I think I, <coughs> let me, yeah, okay. Yeah, learning rate, I think I can just give it as uh, second parameters. Let's just take it for granted for now. I ex will explain it in a second. That now, this object now, and I call it like this, will compute the gradients for me. And I will explain it in a second. But the point is, I'm doing this step by step to show you how we go from doing it from scratch with PyTorch. And that is very similar, actually. So this is what we did before. And I actually want to... Uh, comment it out now. So this we just do as before, splitting for several epochs, splitting into batches. And now I do the following. Now this is not, I put the flatten back in the model again. It's, you can decide, do you want to have it here or in the, it's just a detail. So, so now I'm computing the uh, outputs of my model. Yes, so I'm just applying the model, which uh, this is nothing special. I'm sorry for jumping around a bit. And what I do here, if I call it like this, it will just execute. You have to call this function forward. So it will just call this 
on my uh, batch of things now. Very easy, right? So this, this here is now the output for, of my model for each thing in the, uh, for each document in the batch here. What's the next one? I'm sorry. Now I'm computing the loss. Here it says binary cross entropy. Don't worry, I have a slide on that. So now I'm computing the gradient. And uh, the gradient between, this is my ground truth label, so in my file where it says one or zero, and now it's computing the loss function. And I'm claiming this is minus the log likelihood from the last lecture, and I have a slide on why. And I do it like this, and now I want to compute the gradients of the loss, which, <laughs> I mean, this is just one line, but we worked really hard in the last lecture to find out that formula. And now comes, uh, if we go to the, I think, I can also, yeah, let me just, uh, let me just do it this way. Loss backward, this computes the gradient. Yeah? Compute the gradient of the loss. And it computes the gradient because above here I uh, specified a method, it's called stochastic gradient descent, it's on the slide or will be on the slides in a second. And now I say uh, update the parameters. Yeah, and that's a bit, I will explain that in a second in more detail. But that's doing exactly the same as here. Let's go through it again. I'm just computing the current values. I'm computing the loss, the difference to how it should actually be. Y cross entropy, I will explain. Now I'm computing the gradient. Why is it called backward? We will see in a second. Now with this gradient I compute it. I will make, I will update the weights. So step, just update the parameters. And how does it know? Yeah, here I said use uh, this way of updating and this is the learning grade. So this will effectively do uh, W equals W minus uh, learning rate times. And we can check it by seeing whether we get the same output in a second. And then actually what it does internally, it, it, it adds it to the gradients. That's a technical thing. So here you have to zero the gradients again. So this optimizer just has variable for all the gradients. And if I don't zero them, and then in the next step, it will add to those. So this is a technical thing, because in some settings you, you want that. You actually want several steps and add, add up. Here I don't want that. So I think, I mean, some things are cryptic here. Let's, uh, let's have some explanations. Okay, let's first verify that. I'm not, we can run it now. If I didn't make a mistake, I can run the code just the same and I don't know whether it will work. I mean, we changed a lot. I deleted stuff, add bias. I'm, hmm, it's going for one. Oh, there's no, actually, where, where do I still have add bias? I'm still using it apparently, but I'm not sure. Predict, oh my, ah, oh the prediction, here's the prediction, I see XB, I don't need that, right? Okay, when I do the evaluation, I also have to use my model, so here I think I'm just using, yeah, I think I'm just bold here, and I'm calling my model here. And the outputs of my model are, I think the outputs are already sigmoid things, right? So I have to put a 0 0.5 here. I just want to decide funny or not. So the model computes the sigmoid. If it's greater or equal 0 0.5, it's a, a yes. Otherwise, it's a no. Let's try it again. Hmm. Now you don't see the previous results, but maybe you remember them. Suspense, suspense, hmm, I think it looks the same, right? Doesn't it? 86, yeah, that was for 10 epochs. That was 86, 65, 24, 38. It's exactly the same. 
which is quite amazing. I hope you can appreciate that because, I mean, it's only few, but here, we could, this is the formula we did in the last lecture, and now we just used stuff from PyTorch, right? And it did exactly the same thing. And how did it do that? And I will now explain. And then we have a break. Three more slides, then we have a break. So it does do exactly the same. So if it's not clear now, at least you should appreciate it later or when you do this sheet, this was a major thing now. Now we used PyTorch. We let PyTorch compute the gradient. I will explain in a second how it did it. And the result is exactly the same. That's quite amazing. So last lecture and sheet, we worked hard to compute this formula, computed the gradient, used it to update the W. It's not blue. Can't go on like this. Terrible. Ah, so far the mistakes are just. So on the previous slide it says cross entropy. What's cross entropy, and then why does it give the same result? So the cross entropy is just a function that compares two probability distributions. Forget about the term. You should understand that it make, should make sense, right? So my. And let me just show you the uh, documents again. This gives me a probability distribution for this document. It's an extreme one, right? It says 100% funny. Actually, the, my input could also tell me I'm not sure about this movie, or I, I could say it's 80% funny or something like this. Our training examples could also give probability distributions, but they are just 0 or 1. So this just says 100% funny, 0% not funny, and now my prediction says 80% funny. So, uh, and now what's the difference between these two? What's the difference between my prediction and uh, the ground truth? And this is a way, and we saw earlier that more general models uh, maybe have probability distributions over more things. So, so here, I'm, and that's a very common thing to measure the difference between what I predict, difference between two distributions. And now I have this formula, which looks strange, right? Why should you, you, you're measuring the difference between two things, you would expect like something, the sum of the absolute of the differences. Why is it, this is also not even symmetrical, it's sum i pi times log qi. And I don't think it's even log, it's log 2 which is uh, it's log base 2, I think so. I would love to explain cross entropy because entropy and cross entropy are just beautiful concepts. And we had a lecture on information retrieval so far, which we had to for now take out for reasons of time. It would take me 15 minutes, no time for that. We need it for other things. This lecture from the information retrieval course, for those of you who know it, it's about compression. I have something, I have symbols, I want to encode them using bits. How many bits do I need on average? That's what compression, that's what entropy measures. And what cross entropy measures, let me say it in one sentence, although it may be hard to understand. You're using an encoding of symbols into bits that optimal for one probability distribution and you use it to encode symbols which you get according to another probability distribution. This is what cross entropy measures and it gives you some number. The only thing you need to understand for now for here is that's the formula and lower is better. So when the two are the same, this is the lowest. It's not easy to see from that formula. But what is very easy to see is if you plug this in, so this is the prediction from logistic regression, this uh, sigmoid of, the, that's what we did for logistic regression and the yi, <laughs> then you just, I mean, let's just do it. Let's just plug it in without understanding why this formula makes sense. Let's just do it. And then you will see yi comma sigma Uh, this should be I here. Let's just plug it in, what's up here. This is just minus sum 
of i, I think it was, uh, yeah, let's not write what we sum over the batch. So I get uh, pi, so that's the yi, a label, which was 0 or 1, times, no, no, I w I'm sorry, i is not the, it's the two probabilities, I was confusing. I am, yeah, I'm sorry, I see what the problem here is, these, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry for the slide. Uh, let me want to keep the annotations. Yeah, I don't know whether. Just a second. The problem, the confusion here is this i here is the items of my probability distribution, and this is an index over my uh, sample. So this is a bit. Let me just do it for one sample here and then try again. I hope it will become clear when I write the formula. So let's just do, so here I have a true label and the prediction. And now some magic mathematics and according to the formula that's uh, the probability that this is I think this was uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> y times, ah, okay, now it says log 2, it's also not quite right as I realize now, sigma times x, and the probability of the Ah, a little bit of confusion here, but I... So actually, when the ground truth label is y, we want a probability distribution, which is y and 1 minus y, right? This I explained earlier. So what you actually, <laughs> what you want here is not a single value, you want a probability distribution. And here you also want a probability distribution. So I... Mm, How do I write this? Uh, give me a second. I hope it's clear what I'm so... For logistic regression, I have a probability distribution over two things. And in the last lecture, I just wrote the one probability. And the other one was the... Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Yeah, I'm just uh, wondering a bit how I... Let's be patient and do it again. So this is... Let me write it like this. And I hope it's clear. So this is... The y is actually y minus y as a probability. And this is... Uh, this here is sigma... So if I turn it into probability distributions, it's like this. And now if I write it down, so now I have a, mm -hmm. well, let me write it on top of each other. So that's the probability and the counter probability for the other event. So I'm now computing the cross entropy between these two, and that's now minus uh, y times log 2 of sigma. I just plug it in, and then minus again. So let me do it like this, plus 1 minus <coughs> times uh, log 2 of 1 minus sigma. And this is, uh, it's not, uh, last time we had the ln, here we have log 2 because that's just in the definition of 
So it's uh, log 2 and not ln. Let me not correct that on the slide. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just the same thing. And I could also talk more about why. I mean, that's just what we had in the last lecture, right? Except the minus. We also had, we just derived at it differently by computing a likelihood and then taking the logarithm, but it just happens to be the entropy. So sorry for the notational uh, confusion here. Now I touched my microphone. And here are, uh, so that's the reason why this year binary cross entropy, it just uh, computes a formula that's based, that's minus the likelihood, modulo ln versus log 2. But optimizing the one is like optimizing the other. So what's the advantage of our more generic code? We already saw, uh, and last thing before the break, and then last part. So as I said, we hard-coded uh, the gradient, and now look what we did. Appreciate this, please. So here, we define our model. This is just a model function. We just say, use this function to evaluate it. So here, we can do other stuff now, if we want a different model function. But look at this code here, which we have now, and let me just delete the old code. This is absolutely generic now, right? That's the point. I'm evaluating my model function. I say, how do I want to compute the loss? And this here is like, it, it, PyTorch does it for me. It computes the gradients. So I can now define any model function I want and use the same code here, and uh, let's see what it will do. So that's the thing. Yeah, you can define a much more, com and I mean, if I now give you a much more model function and then say, now please compute the gradients, well, that's uh, a lot of work. And you could also use a different loss function if you like, but we will use, uh, I will say more about this in the second part. And now, before we go into the break, let me at least give you a hint how because that's an interesting question. You don't need to understand it for the exercise sheet, but it's interesting. How does PyTorch figure out how to compute the gradient here? I mean, I'm not telling it. How, how does it know that? And at least let me give you a hint. It's very, and why on earth is it called backward? One slide, how does PyTorch manage this? It's beyond the scope, but I think it's a, <clears throat> So what you do in this model uh, forward method here, and we will see a more extreme example soon, I'm just uh, putting a function together from yeah, components. I'm saying, OK, this linear function, which was w times x minus the b, and then apply a sigmoid to it. I could do much more complicated stuff here. What this effect effectively does is function composition. We will see in this uh, second part of the lecture, we will compose a lot of functions. So we are writing our model function as something, yeah, k different functions, and then we just uh, apply them to each other like this. That's what you always do. And these are simpler functions, like functions which PyTorch knows, like this linear function, the sigmoid functions. And by the way, each of these functions has parameters, some of the parameters of the whole thing. The parameters of these functions in total give the parameters of the whole model. And then on top, I compute the loss. The loss is just another function which adds to this composition. So now I have loss of this year uh, minus this. So I have one big function, which is a composition of a lot of functions. Now, if you're computing the gradients or derivatives of a composition of a lot of functions, you can compute this from the derivatives of the individual functions via the chain rule, right? You know the chain rule. I think it's, it's school stuff. And PyTorch just knows all the derivatives. If you just use PyTorch components, it knows the derivatives of this function you use, of this, of this, and now you compose them together. It remembers how you compose them and then knows how to derive compute partial derivatives of this big thing. And from that compute the gradient. And the algorithm which does this, we will not talk about it here, is called backpropagation. It's a strange name, it's an algorithmic name, 
because it's like the algorithm which does it if you implement a chain rule for complex it, it but that's not important that's why it's called backwards it's named after the algorithm to compute uh, to apply the chain rule here and it's a just one side remark that's a bit strange <coughs> But I think it's interesting, it's the last thing before the break. I've, we talked about this, Sebastian, and I, PyTorch is written from like the perspective of people applying this stuff. So let me do a step of backpropagation. If you would do it mathematical cleaner, you would say compute gradient here, right? That would be the appropriate name. But PyTorch, you will see this in many places, just uh, views this from the approach of someone who just uh, wants to to do learning stuff so in an operational way not in a mathematical way that's why <coughs> we, we will see another example of this yeah so uh, compute gradient would be a better name now we have the break and then the second part so five minutes break thank you so let's continue second part Just to take off again, there are two levels of understanding this. One, 99% of people doing learning probably just have the understanding, you have to write this and then it works. That's one way of understanding. I mean, that's, I think, how most people are using these frameworks. But understand, this computes the gradient and this adds the gradient to the weights. And there's a lot of magic behind the scene. And now, with this small step, logistic regression does the same as before. Now we can use a much more complex model function. And let's do that in the second part. And we have done the hard part now. This is now just... So what's the task for the rest? Uh, now we want a different task. So, so far it was binary classification. And by the way, let me say this one thing. I mentioned multinomial... Uh, just to see how easy it is to now generalize this. Now maybe I want multinomial logistic regression. Now I just have to put a function here. Here I maybe don't want linear n comma number of classes. So now I get k different values and now I need a function that turns it into a probability distribution. We will talk about it in a few slides. That's also an easy function. I just put that function here. It's called softmax, by the way. And then I have multinomial. Uh, so I just put a k here, number of classes, and a different function here, and it will do all the rest for me. I have multinomial regression. I went from binary to multiple classes in, without adding a line of code. So, but we don't want multinomial, uh, so multi-class regression. We want next word prediction, or rather next token prediction. So this is much harder. And one thing, I didn't really say it, but let me mention it now. So the question is, you have this function here, which uh, it exists, but you can't compute it. Now you have your model function. The question is, which model functions are suited for the approximation of which functions? And if this is a complex, I mean, if this is a very simple function, like uh, plain and simple, you don't need a complex model function here. If this is a very complicated function, you need a complicated function here. So just to say this. So now we need a more complicated function. Now, now, essentially, we will give you a function now, because in three lectures for this whole linear algebra thing, we can't explain everything, although we would love to, but at least we will give you some intuition. And your job, pay attention for exercise sheet 12, will be understand the framework, as I've explained it so far, take the model function, we give it to you, and put it together in the right way. Just putting it together in the right way already requires understanding how this all works. And of course, there's the forum for question. And then a little twist at the end. I will come to this in a few slides. And you absolutely have to do the exercise. You only learn this stuff by doing. Or it's true for all the exercises. I mean, you have to do this, and then you see all these. Then you understand it, especially with when you do mistakes. 
So now it's I have n words predict the next word. So I have a vocabulary again. Let's look at here. So far our vocabulary was words. So all the different words. So maybe I have 100,000 different words here or 50,000 or I don't know. Just the distinct words. And we will denote the size by small v in the following. Important when I'm talking about language models, one thing is words given some number of words predict the next word. It can also be uh, characters. And for exercise sheet 12, you can try both. We give you both tokenizers. You could also break this into characters, just the letters. And then given 12 letters <laughs> predict, the, uh, 12 characters predict the next character. Now here's one question, just as a tangent. Why, why did we choose would, would what we have done in the last lecture have also worked for characters? If our tokenizer splits this into characters, and then you have a vector, I give you embeddings for characters, you sum them up, you get a, a vector, and then you ask, is it funny or not? What do you think? Yeah? Yeah, what, when you do that, you, you get, think about what adding up these embeddings did. It tells you this word occurs so many times, this word. It doesn't tell you anything about the sequence of words. Just there's Harry in it three times. And now it will tell you the letter E is in here five times. So now you have to predict just from, <laughs> here I have a movie plot with seven times the letter E, five times the letter T, and so on, predict whether it's funny or not. Maybe it's possible, maybe not. Now we will do something different. We will consider the order. And when you consider the order, then of course it makes sense, right? You are asking, given this, what's the next character? And uh, the framework, what I will show you, is agnostic. It doesn't care what the tokens are, whether it's words or characters. So that's an easy change, especially since we give the tokenizers to you. You can just, yeah, we give both to you break it into words, break it into characters. It will be interesting to see the difference. We provide, uh, we is Sebastian. Uh, so we call the sequence what we input, the context, that's called the context. So the input is K tokens, or not K, because uh, we will call it C. So the length of the, yeah, given so many, and by the way, GPT and so on, well, what you can use now also via API, the content length is a big thing, right? So how much context does it consider? Given the last 1,000 words or characters predict the next word. Of course, the more t context you have, the more meaningful you can predict. If the context length is just one, then just from one word predict the next word. Forget everything before. But it's more expensive, as we will see. So number of things, letters or words, V, context length, C, these parameters we have. So now comes something which falls from heaven. So this is now, and let's go back one more time to this code. Here's our logistic, <laughs> it was very simple. It just had this uh, linear weight here and then applied it with a sigmoid function. So. Here's <laughs> what you do for the language model. We would love to explain this more. I will explain it a little bit. So there's more stuff now, more functions which I put together. And I have some comments here. So this model is uh, from Sebastian. We have tried around with stuff uh, a little bit. I have a slide where I will explain a little bit about these things. But the important thing for you to understand is this is now just a more complex function which I compose from simpler functions. So let me not go into the details here. And each of these functions has uh, parameters. Let me go to the next slide. And some things look familiar here, right? So here I have a function which just takes an input, multiplies it by, this is a matrix now here. Yeah, everything is 
tensors, vectors, you multiply it by matrix, you get another vector, you take that vector, you plug it into a function, you get another vector. That should be clear, right? You just start with some vector and you apply all kinds of functions and you get another vector. And I deliberately didn't put for loops here or something like this. You wouldn't write it like this in the code, but you can so that you see I'm just uh, applying functions here. By the way, this is not yet the forward pass. This is just all the individual functions I have. I'm just defining them, right? So just so I hear somebody whispering, if you have a question, please do ask. So this, what this does, it defines a function with parameters, right? That's why I call it F3. It's a linear function which takes something of this dimensionality as input and gives something of that dimensionality as output, which means it's a DC times D matrix. That's what matrices do. They take vector from one dimension, give you a vector of another dimension. And let's, uh, let's maybe before this slide look at the, this is the forward function. So now what I do is I, I just do all kinds of functions. I will come back to this in a second. So here I do a matrix multiplication with these weights. More matrix multiplications I add it together. Here I do some flattening again. And now I, this year I just, and now I have something, a vector, I apply F3 to it, F4, F5, F6, F7, F8. And then I, now I still have a vector and then I apply F9 to it and I get another vector and that's my output. So, and yeah, and the question is, why do you do it like this? I will explain a little bit, but just most of it you have to take for granted. But understand, I'm just composing a function from simpler functions. So let's try to understand some of these functions here. Linear, you can understand, I just explained it. What's GLU, what's layer norm, and what are these? Uh, these are just uh, functions here. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just, uh, why are the first two lines just weights and not functions like in the remaining line? That's one thing to note, you may want to understand it. So why is it not F1 to F9 and then I just compose like apply F1, then F2, F3, F9. The reason is these are functions which PyTorch provides you. So multiplying something with a matrix and we will talk about this. Sometimes you want to do stuff which is not provided by a Python, PyTorch. And this is actually what happens here. So here I'm taking these weights, multiplying it with some uh, other vector and I get a result. And here I'm multiplying these weights and then I'm adding this up. So I can also do this. Just so you understand on this level, Sometimes I can just use functions from PyTorch. Sometimes I want to write functions myself. So that's the reason for this. No predefined uh, function for this, so we just do it ourselves. What is GLU? Well, GLU, <laughs> clear, right? It's the smoothest version of ReLU, just like the programming language C is the successor of B. <laughs> that's the correct answer. So uh, let me very briefly, <coughs> you always, you saw the sigmoid function, right? The sigmoid function looks like uh, this, very roughly. So yeah, you have here 0 0.5 and so on. That's the sigmoid function. Then there is uh, ReLU, looks like this. And I think it's, uh, I think it looks like this. <coughs> So it's a much simpler function. It has the, I could talk a lot about what's the advantages of this function. One thing you can see, it has a sharp edge. It's all zero here. That's a bit problematic when you compute partial derivatives and stuff. So what, uh, let me look at the pic, let's look at a picture of uh, GLU. Yeah, GLU is just, a, it's a, a smoother version of this duck duck function, right? So that it has partial derivatives, that it's not all zero to the left and so on. So it's just a, so GLU, 
just looks like and then makes a yeah and it's just a bit more smooth and now the question is and there's a lot of stuff of this kind we don't have time to go into this use this it works better right you could also try uh, here and put use the sigmoid function or something like this or not use this why why does it work these are important questions but yeah there are reasons for this of course one reason here why gilu is better than relu is that relu has this it's all zero it uh, it's not differentiable at at zero and so on it's nicer to have a smooth function just some pieces of information. What is layer norm? Just so you know what function this is. This just, you have some input and maybe these are very large numbers. So one way would, one way to, no, we have seen normalization, let's just normalize, we have 300 values in a vector, let's normalize them so that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. And what the layer norm is, it does scale it in this way but to some mean and some deviation, which are parameters, which means they change during the training. So that's what, it has two parameters, or so weights, and uh, then it scales the input according to these weights. And these weights can change, they are updated during the training. So this is just, and there's not too much else here, right? And then I'm just, so I have linear, we have seen this, Gilu, I just explained it, normalizing a little bit, you do that because for some reason by these functions your numbers can become very large, right? You always have, that's also I think understandable stability problems. What if your numbers become larger and larger and then it overflows? So it's always good to normalize. But how do you want to normalize really so that the mean is zero? Let the, let the function figure it out by itself. So here I just have, yeah function normalization and so on. And now, yeah, let's try to, I can just give you hints here. So this part is like clear, you just uh, concatenate, compose these functions. What about this here? Hmm. Let me try to under explain it as best as I can, but it's really just uh, intuition. So as input, our model gets as input the token IDs. Gets, let's go line by line. So it just tells you, so you have a context, let's say 10 tokens. Let's talk about words. Let's talk about words. You can do the same with characters. I have 10 words. I want to predict the next word. So the first word, let's just say I have 1,000 words in my vocabulary and I want its word number 12. So the token ID, this is just a vector now of 10 IDs. And the first one is word number 12. I first turn it into a one-hot vector, right? If my vocabulary has 1,000 uh, words, it will be a vector with all zero, but at position uh, 12, the index of the word, I have a one. We have seen that. And let's forget about the positions for a second. Let's just look at the token. And now I'm multiplying this with the weights. And what I will get now is for each vector, I now get an embedding vector, like the ones which we gave to you. This is what this matrix multiplication does. If I multiply this one hot vector with this weight matrix, I just get a certain line or column from that weight matrix, which means now I have an embedding vector and we can actually also see which dimension it has. Yeah, so this here gives me a d-dimensional uh, embedding vector for each word or token from my vocabulary, but these are weights, which means these can, these can change now through the process. And this is not a very satisfactory explanation, but at least it tells you something. So. I'm not inputting embeddings here, but they are part of the things that can change throughout the process. So that's how it's related to our things. So no need to give you embeddings here. This step here now, it just computes an embedding uh, for each uh, item from the vocabulary and these can change over training. That's, I think, gives some understanding. And. Uh, and now I do the same thing with positions and I add this up 
So without the position, I've explained it now, I do the same thing again, but not... So here I get as input 10 IDs if my context, context length is 10 of 10 tokens, and this will turn it into 10 embeddings now. And then I do the same with positions. I can also explain it only... Uh, yeah. So now this will do the same thing. Each position now gets a unique number. And now I also have an embedding for each position. So I have a distinct vector for position one in the context. I have a distinct number for position two. Let's say the context length is 10. I have a distinct number for each position. And uh, I have weights which give me an embedding for each position. So I have a distinct vector now, and how this vector looks like is something which can change over the, uh, over the course for each position. And I just, uh, I just add this to the... And now, and, and I'm sorry I can't give deeper intuition here, at least this gives the model some way to know something about the position. It, at least there's now a difference in how we did it before, there was absolutely no difference if I sort this movie plot by words, right? There's, it was just ignoring the order. Nothing in how, what we did in the last lecture considered the order. Now, at least, we are considering the order, right? Because we are saying, okay, the first, for the first thing, we give it some embedding vector and add it. And how does it help? That, that would require a deeper explanation. I don't have time for it, but at least we are considering the position. So it's a bit unsatisfactory that we are just throwing these things at you, but yeah, you can use them and see how it works. That's as much, I think, as we can do in one lecture. So at least we are considering position information and it would not work. I hope that's clear. Next word, prediction without position information cannot really and here's one thing that can be understood again. And let me explain that because it's quite beautiful. That's always the same thing. The last layer, what do we want? We want the probability distribution over the things in our vocabulary. I want the probability distribution over V things. Whatever you do here, it always gives you numbers. And the final thing gives you now V numbers. So I have 1,000 items in my vocabulary, and now I have 1,000 numbers. Any numbers, minus 12.5, 0, 5 point, like for logistic regression, right? I've, I do the dot product, and now I get minus 12, 0 0.5, 173. Now I have to turn it into probability. Now I have to turn these into a probability distribution. How do I do that? That's, you always, so we have to turn our output in a probability distribution. And that's what, uh, okay, that's what the, so let me go to the one. That's what the softmax function that. So the softmax takes a vector of any values, and that's not a bold face here. That's the, so it's M real numbers, <laughs> and it's super nice. That's how you, and the question is, you could do it in a number of ways. Let's just do it in this way. So we take each component e to the power of that. I'm just doing it, y, you will see in a second. And then I'm dividing it by the sum of all these. Now it should be, it is very easy to see that that's always a probability distribution. It's kind of one explanation of softmax is, think about it, what's the easiest way to turn m numbers into a probability distribution over m things? That's the easiest way. Why? Probabilities need to be non-negative. e to the anything is a non-negative number. So that's like the easiest thing, to turn anything into a negative, non-negative number. And now these things sum to e to the z1 plus e to the zm just divide it by that, now it sums to 1. So it's kind of, yeah, it's the easiest function which turns this into probability distribution. And this we already saw, it's a probability distribution over m things. Here's one very beautiful thing. We did the same with sigmoid. Sigmoid is actually a special case of this. 
so nice, uh, easy to see. So if we have a single value and we want to turn it into probability, how, as I said, single value, so uh, let's make two values out of it. Let's say, okay, we have z and zero. Z, like zero, if you think of the input to the sigmoid function, negative means no, positive means yes, zero means I don't know. So here I have my output, let me take zero here. And let's look at what is the softmax of this one number and the zero here. <coughs> yeah, what is it? It gives you two probabilities. This is just uh, one minus the, the other, it's just two. So let's look at p, and p will now be e to the, this number, e to the z divided by yeah, e to the z plus e to the other number, which we set to zero. And uh, yeah, <coughs> I mean, we can just just do the, I mean, it's basically, let me just write it here, e to the z divided by e to the z plus e to the zero is one. I just divide by <coughs> e to the minus z at the top, at, at, at the bottom here minus z plus e to the minus z, and that then is 1 over 1 plus e to the minus z, and that's just the sigmoid function, right? So it's, it's really, yeah, you can see it both ways. Softmax is generaliz generalization of sig sigmoid to more than one thing, or sigmoid is just a special case of the softmax. And that was also our intuition in the last lecture, right? We have to turn a number into probability. Let's take sigmoid. It's the simplest function which does that. And that's what softmax does. So we just, that's what we do in the end. And now, here's another thing. PyTorch is full of these peculiarities, and it's a good way to explain it again. Why? You would expect that the last layer here, this is my model function, and it should output a probability distribution. It does not. Here it outputs V numbers. Shouldn't there be self F10 is softmax of the last one? Then it would output the probability distribution. Yes, it would be the meaningful way to do, but, but I will come to the but now. That's on this slide uh, seven. Now I need a loss function, like before, right? Now uh, my model, let's say it predicts a probability distribution, and here's the probability distribution from my input. Now I want to compare the two. Now I need a measure that compares two probability distribution. We have already used binary cross entropy for logistic regression. Now we need cross entropy. Well, PyTorch doesn't have a function for cross entropy, which is, at least Sebastian and I haven't found it yet which is uh, super strange. I mean, the thing is, unfortunately, PyTorch is not really a mathematics library. It's a library for doing stuff, for learning stuff. And when you learn stuff, when you do it, this, this model learning, you always have a model that outputs numbers. And then, uh, so what, what it has, it has a function, cross entropy loss, which takes two arguments. The second argument is indeed the probability distribution that comes from your, uh, from your test set or training set, your input, where you know the values. And the first argument is just a vector. And then <laughs> it applies softmax to the first argument and not to the second argument. So it does the softmax implicitly, which is kind of encoding that's convenient because you always have it that way. Otherwise, you would always have to add the softmax layer uh, by yourself. It also efficiency considerations, but for from point of view of abstraction, it's a bit strange, right? Let me just say it one more time. In PyTorch, you don't have a function cross entropy, which computes the cross entropy between two probability distributions. Instead, you have a function cross entropy loss, which computes, takes the first argument is just values, which cross entropy loss turns into the distribution via a softmax function, and the second argument is a probability distribution. Strange, but that's how it is. 
And that's the reason, I hope that's uh, clear by this, why you don't, uh, why the output, why the last thing here is not, yeah. Because if you would have softmax here and you would have, now you have a probability distribution, you plug it into cross entropy loss, it would compute the softmax. It would turn it again into a probability distribution. And one little exercise, I'm sorry for jumping around, you might wonder, what is if you apply this to something that already is a probability distribution? It's not idempotent, right? It doesn't remain the same. Just uh, think about it. I mean, for example, if I, let's say I already have a probability distribution. Is softmax of this, does it remain a probability distribution? No, right? I don't think so. Let's just do it. Softmax of 0, 0,5, 0, 0,5 becomes, yeah, what does it become? It becomes uh, e to the 0 0.5 divided by 2 to the 0. It doesn't look like uh, the same function, right? Or is it? No, no, that's a bad example because that is, again, it's this. that's a bad example. Okay, now I'm confused. Is it, for so for if they are all the same, then they remain all the same. I think we have to take a bad example. It's just a question which you may wonder. Let's just take 1 over 4, 3 over 4. And now it becomes uh, e to the 1 over 4 divided by uh, sum of the two, let me just call it e, e to the 3 over 4 divided by sum of the two, where e is e to the 1 over 4, so it does again become another probability distribution, but that is certainly not equal to 1 over 4, 3 over 4. If you think about it, I mean, it's just a small tangent. What will happen? I think softmax pushes the things more to the extreme, right? E to the, if this is, yeah, I think it will, things become more extreme. I think this becomes smaller and this becomes larger. I think that's what will happen. Figure it out yourself. But yeah, so that's strange. And, uh, it's the same kind of strangeness like with the backward. Let's go to the code for a second. And PyTorch is full of that. I don't like it, it's not nice, but that's how it is. This shouldn't be called loss backward, it should be compute gradient, right? Because that's what it does mathematically. But it, uh, it says backward because it uses an algorithm called, you shouldn't call a function after the algorithm it used to implement. And the same, uh, for cross entropy loss, which doesn't compute the cross entropy, but does something with the first argument. But yeah. So a lot of people using this is just, oh, you have to use cross entropy loss, then it works. And you don't even need to understand what you're doing. But of course, you should understand what you're doing. Two more things, and then we are done. Oh yeah, by the way, the exercise sheet, let me, let me look at the data sets of the teaching information retrieval. That's the name of the folder. How are our data sets called? Oh, lecture transcripts. Oh, okay. Is it because I'm, it's all in one line? Oh yeah, it's just the transcripts of the lecture. So of the videos, just the text. Welcome everybody to lecture one, information achieved in the blah, blah. It's just the transcript from our lectures, concatenated even from the lectures from last year. So Sebastian did this. And you can just use this as, uh, yeah, use it as input and see where it goes from there, whether it delivers a lecture like I give lectures or not. You can take this, this is one data set we give to you. Also try it with any other set and just see how it works, play around with it. I think it's a lot of fun and you will see it will work. And I think it's, I'm not sure whether it's on the sheet. 
You can also input Sparkle queries, like a half of a Sparkle query, and see whether it continues to write the Sparkle query. You can use it for anything, right? That's the, the power, at least the principal power, of, of language models. Uh, it's really nice that we have this as an exercise. Let me just look at the sheet. Yeah, and so I've explained to you how it works in principle. I've given you, that's something that just falls from heaven, but you just have to accept that. Where, where do we have it here? These, uh, this is basically, yeah, I'm sorry, that's now. You can just copy and paste this. This is your any function, but maybe you also want to play around with it, take a different, yeah, you can just play around, add even more functions, and then this here, for example, one thing, you have some limited, but at least some understanding, for example, try to remove this position information. You can just do that, say, okay, the positions are not important, I can do it without them. Well, just try it, remove it, and see how well it works. So that you can do now, you have full control. <coughs> so the exercise sheet will be to implement this, and you can just use the you can look at the code from the lecture, but Sebastian, again, prepared a great uh, template. So last two slides, what you should do. Prediction. Now you have the model. You have learned some parameter setting. Now you have the model function with that parameter setting, and you can ask it, give me a probability distribution over the words. I don't want the probability distribution. I want the next word. How do I do it? There are two ways, basically. One way, I mean, your model, now you have to use softmax because your model doesn't give you a probability distribution. One way is pick the token with the highest probability and take it. <coughs> so take the letter or word with the highest probability and then proceed. I will say in a second what proceed means. That's not so nice, now it's deterministic. You always, and there's a bound to repeat itself, and so on. A nice, nicer, nicer method is as follows. Pick a K, like 10, and now take the 10 items, words or letters, with the highest probability. This is not a probability distribution, just turn it into a probability distribution, not with softmax, just normalize it to one, just divide it by the sum. So just take the K most, and now pick one of these according to this distribution, right? So that's uh, how it's typically done with these models. And you should implement this. This is fairly straightforward, but it's much nicer. Then you have a probabilistic element, not always picking the most likely one. Now you pick a token, so if you run it again, you always get slightly different results. And now, how do you proceed? You take the first k words or letters, let's say words, you predict the next one, now you have predicted one, now you append that to your context and remove the leftmost one, so that you again have uh, K or C, we call it C the context length, C words from which to, yeah. That's easy to implement, you should do that. And one more thing that's important to understand, the code is also in the template, well, Logistic regression, let me show the program one last time. It's just one program, right? Why do I have a... Oh. It's one big program, and let me maybe uh, run it again. What does it do? It reads the data, tokenizes it, turns it into vectors, trains the model, finds the best parameter setting, and then does the evaluation, all in one program. And it takes some time, and I just did it for one epoch, right? I can, uh, while we're talking, run it for 10 epochs, it will take some time. Now, for a complex, I mean, this will take time. What you want to do is you want to train it, this will take minutes, and now you want to save the parameters. And not only the parameters, you also want to save the hyperparameters, like I took batch size 10, context size 5, and whatever else you parameters you have. So, you want to save it, so we have a program train, which trains it, and then just saves the model, especially the parameters, to a file. And this is called a checkpoint in, in PyTorch, so just the state of it. And what you can even do is, you can just train it forever, that's how Sebastian also did it for his solution, after each epoch, just save what you currently have. 
So which means when you abort your program and it has done three epochs so far, you have the model after three epochs. You might even want to change a different, say, write it to a different file after each epoch. That's easy and it's also easy to do it in PyTorch. It's just in PyTorch with torch save, here you can just put in any dictionary, the code is in the template, save it to that file, load it from that file. So you will just get these .pt files, they are called, <coughs> or you can call them however you like, and how exactly it's done, you will see it on the code template. Okay, not so bad in time. So, I hope many of you will do the exercise. I think it's quite uh, fascinating. Any questions about anything? Yeah, oh, yeah, please. So, uh, like I could not follow, like you said, um, if we use uh, cross entropy loss, yes. we should not use softmax in the last layer. Yeah. Uh, like it, it is the gender change, we should not use it. Like mm. Yeah. And, and what's the question? Like, is it a general approach to not use softmax when we are using cross entropy loss? So let me say it again. Cross entropy loss takes two arguments, mm -hmm. and the first argument is not a probability distribution, and cross entropy loss computes the softmax of the first argument. Oh. It's part of the function. So cross entropy loss computes softmax of first argument, second argument, and then the cross entropy. So it's a strange function. And that's why when you already give it a probability distribution, we compute the softmax again, which is wrong, because softmax of softmax is not softmax. Softmax, if you apply it repeatedly, will change your distribution. Good question. And please do ask uh, in the forum if you have any questions. Any other question for now? So this is the last lecture with real content, the last exercise sheet, the great one, I think. In the next lecture, which is the last for this semester, we will talk about evaluation, about the exam, maybe interesting to some of you, and then about uh, stuff we do at our chair, introduction and everything. So do come. That's it for today. Thank you. Bye.